Okay, time now for another environmental science video. And uh, this video here is about food, soil, and pest management. Uh, pretty important, the idea of food. If we're talking about sustainability, we'll certainly need food. And we have a lot of people to feed currently in the school year 2018-2019, about 7.5 billion people on the planet. And our chapter starts off with a case study, and that's talking about uh, the idea of children who have a lack of nutrients in their food, in particular vitamin A, uh, in this case vitamins, vitamin A. And um, this has devastating effects, and the children are affected more um, in these places where they have the vitamin A deficiency. So hundreds of millions of children who are um, <clears throat> becoming uh, blind, and in some cases leading to death. So they have come up with, human ingenuity has now come up with a way to genetically engineer rice so that it'll put more of these things that are lacking in the diets for these children, and hopefully that'll be helpful. And the idea of this is the golden rice. So we see this story starting up in 1999, and uh, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, but of course, you know, we have to feed more and more people. There's uh, a lot to think of here, and of course, the idea of genetically modified organisms, the GMOs, are radical concepts at this time here, 2018 and 2019. So here's the golden rice. You can see how it stands out in the field. And again, uh, GMOs are genetically engineered uh, to get the things that are lacking, the beta carotene and the vitamin A. So, uh, of course, we're not in 1999 anymore, so I thought it was a good time to check in on the Golden Rice pro Project and see how they're doing. Uh, this is from 2018, 2019, and here is the Golden Rice um, Project. So let's see what we got here, the Golden Rice Project. All right, so this is, as usual, I've put the uh, web page there, and I do always encourage you to go after different place uh, information. So much can be found out here. I'll lead you to some, and you can certainly uh, lead yourself to other ones as well. It's very, fairly easy to do. But this is a good one if we're following up on the Golden Rice Project. And, uh, yeah, I found this to be very... Very interesting. So you might want to check this out as well. Here is a support of GMOs, and this is a Nobel Prize person talking about it. So we get to cover a few different things. How to maybe help out in humanitarian ways by adding nutrients to people in developing parts of the world. And uh, also, we can talk about the idea of genetically modified organisms and whether they're good or whether they're bad. So, like I said again, I would recommend reading through this web page and as many others as you uh, can find. In a very short time, you're going to find out a lot of information. So there we go. And, uh, yeah, please do follow up on as many of these as you possibly can. A little follow up on the Golden Rice Project. All right, it seems to still be going strong in 2018-2019. Okay, so this is um, an inequity too with people who have uh, ways and means and people who don't because um, I am very fortunate, I would say, in my life that I have had food security all the way through. I've never wondered where my next meal was coming from and I've never wondered where the money was going to come from to pay for that. But that is not the case for a lot of people. And I think about this. <clears throat> Whenever you've said to yourself, I'm starving. <laughs> you know, I, I've said that before and it's really never been true. Um, but I'm very hungry, and your energy runs down, and then you start thinking about how hungry you are. And sometimes it, maybe it happens in class, maybe it happens in my class, where you know it's harder to pay attention, and that's understandable. And uh, I certainly get it, and I've certainly been there, and I understand it. But uh, imagine if that was the feeling most of the time, and that's the food insecurity, and that can lead to a lot of other things. And the root cause of a lot of this is poverty. So definitely something to think about as we're. Uh, thinking of the seven and a half billion people on the planet and the implications of all that. Okay, so these are things that we need, and uh, some people suffer because they don't get enough of these things. And we were already talking about the micronutrients, the vitamin A, the beta carotene, and uh, these are the macronutrients as, uh, nutrients as well. So you should know a little bit about uh, the things that human beings need to uh, prosper food-wise, what they need to get the uh, energy and, uh, and uh, what they need, and we'll talk about that a little bit, and what happens when you don't get those things. And then we'll also talk about when you get too much of it. 
it. But uh, chronic undernutrition is where you just don't get enough of the calories. Now this is another number besides the seven and a half billion. Now you should know the world population. It may change, but in the year 2018, 2019, seven and a half billion is a good estimate. And also for nutrition, a good number to know is that 2,000 calories is what you're supposed to uh, have per day. And that's a fairly well-known number. Um, and seems to not have changed since caveman days too much. Very interesting uh, to think about that, or the latest thing I read. But uh, yes, of course, without enough calories, it's going to stunt your growth mentally and physically and compromise your immune system, and uh, that's, that's not so great. Another thing is even if you're getting the right number of calories or you're getting the right kind of foods, and that's uh, chronic malnutrition. So there's people who are able to get enough calories, but the cheaper foods tend to be uh, maybe not as nutritious. Uh, it costs a lot more to make a salad uh, than it does to make an Oreo cookie, apparently. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's just an example, but uh, certainly uh, that's a problem as well. All right, so here it breaks it down for you. Good to pause. No offense if you pause the video. That's a good thing to do. Uh, but just the idea here again that the proteins uh, are helping to rebuild our body tissue, to build and rebuild the body tissue, so that's pretty important. And the carbohydrates, our wheat, our corn, and our rice, that's what gives us the short-term energy. And also to know that we need the uh, oils and the fats for uh, tissues and hormones, so pretty good stuff and uh, all necessary. So without these, you're going to have undernutrition, and if you're not getting, uh, if you're not getting enough of the calories, if you're not getting enough of these things that you need, then you have malnutrition. So uh, here we're talking about people who don't get enough of these things and what the problems will be. And of course, all of these things are harder to keep from happening if you are in poverty. You're focusing on a lot of different things if you're in poverty than if you have food security. Okay, so uh, one-third in the developing countries we see uh, suffer in some of the things that we're talking about. So we talked about the golden rice as help helping with the vitamin A. Um, if you don't have enough iron, that could be anemia. And here is a shocking picture, of course, of a woman in Bangladesh with a goiter. And that is because of, what is the cause? That's because of uh, insufficient iodine. So that's an extreme case there, of course, but um, surely, you know, going to be hoping that people have enough food uh, to get by. Nice to have food security. Okay, so a famine is where there's not enough food to go around, and uh, that's where, uh, you know, this has happened a lot of time in human history, and that's part of the reason that uh, people from the background that I'm from, Ireland, came over. Some of my background, I'm from a lot of different places. Uh, but the um, Irish part of my family came over because of the famine, like a lot of people did from Ireland. All right, so that can be caused by a lot of things. Drought, flooding, there it was a uh, potato famine, uh, war and other events. And uh, when this happens, um, that's going to affect the people in a big way. Um, for one thing, right away, hunger, that's a big thing. And people aren't going to be hungry and happy for too long. And then there's uprisings or people trying to leave where they're at to a place where they can get food easier. That causes a stress on the places that have the new people coming into them. So there's all these chain reactions going on that. So famine is not a good thing uh, for the people experiencing it, the people around them. And we have to make some decisions about that. In some cases, war can break out because of famine and uh, a lot of unrest, so uh, something to try to avoid. Of course, not to be, uh, not, not to be, uh, not something I can really understand. I haven't been in a situation of famine, but it, uh, you, you can only imagine how terrible it probably is. All right, well, here, I've from time to time had this where I should be eating more salads when I could be, and that's overnutrition. So um, if you were eating too much, that uh, cuts down on your health uh, as well. So that's a problem. We're in a developing part of the, a developed part of the world uh, where you just uh, you know, you have uh, too much of a good thing, I guess. It's too available to you if you have enough money and uh, you live a place where it's readily available. So that's more of a problem in the developed world uh, here. Okay, so food production has changed a bunch. So um, we get most of our food in the croplands, and uh, so we see that 77% uh, of that is food, and uh, then uh, we also, and that's 11% of the total land area on the planet. So rangelands and pasture lands and feedlots, so that's 16%. Um, for the food and 29% of the world's land area and now we're starting to also go into aquaculture. So the croplands obviously that where we grow things and then the rangelands of course is where we're raising things as well. 
uh, raising animals uh, to feed, animals who are also going to need crops to uh, feed on as well. So wheat, rice, and corn are where we get most of our calories from. So 47% of the world's calories come from wheat, rice, and corn. So that's the top three of 14 edible plant species. All right, let's think about that for a little bit. There's 14 edible plant species that supply 90% of the world's calories. I've given you the top three. I don't know. What are the other, what are the other 11? I don't know, but uh, how about this one? How many plant species do you think humans can eat? I'm interested in that question, by the way. What are the other 11 edible plant species? I Maybe mean, we should try to figure that one out in class. So uh, how many plant species can humans eat? How many exist? Well, it's 50,000. What was your guess? <laughs> 50,000. That's a lot. But uh, 14 of them are supplying 90% of the food calories. Very interesting. Okay, so now we're in a uh, time period of industrialized agriculture. So we are able to farm the land in ways we couldn't do before. So productive uh, now in what we're doing. So um, we're able to now, because of this industrialized agriculture, we don't need as much human labor anymore. And we're able to, um, you know, uh, we, uh, you farm and harvest on a lot larger area. So that's uh, steadily increased our crop yield per unit of land as well because uh, we're, we're getting pretty good at it. So some of this is plantation agriculture, and in areas where there are rainforests, um, we're doing plantations, and in there they are, um, you know, raising bananas, soybeans, which feed the livestock a lot. You know, we have a lot of livestock to feed, as we mentioned. Uh, Sugarcane is one thing that gets grown there. That's for ethanol. We have coffee plantations and uh, palm oil. So all of these industrialized ways that we're going after the farming and, and, and our agriculture are uh, emitting more greenhouse gases, so there's that part of it as well. And uh, all of these things you could take a look at. I want to take a look at palm oil a little bit uh, before we gloss over that. And here's a website called the Rainforest Rescue, and there it is again, rainforestrescue.org. Uh, so that'll give you a lot of things about the rainforest, and uh, one of their pages is about the palm oil. Uh, but like I said, I recommend you click on these things and take a quick look at them. So this is the idea of everyday products. They say that 50% of the products that you'll find in a supermarket have palm oil in them. And in order to raise the palm oil, it's this uh, deforestation that happens in the rainforest for these plantations. So it's in the food, it's in cosmetics, cleaning products, and fuels. Okay. Uh, and again, it's uh, you know, deforestation, loss of biodiversity, and uh, here you go. So the palm oil consumption at this time, you know, 2017 here anyway, 7.7 .7 million tons. That's in the European Union alone. 39% of that went to food and products, and then uh, energy uh, was the other 61%. So yeah, there you go. The rainforest on our dinner tables and in our fu uh, fuel tanks. So interesting. Again, you know, we're not separated from this stuff. Uh, we are uh, using these products as well. Uh, this also happens, like I said, or I'm trying to say in the U.S., not just in the European Union. All right, so it gives you things that you can do, and it talks a little bit about palm oil and... Uh, yeah, and well, and we're just about to mention too, and in the background here is a, a little bit apparently of slash and burn agriculture. Uh, so we'll talk about that. All right, so palm oil is a big part of it. All right, so that's what palm oil is from. So we gloss over these terms, and they, they end up having these big effects. Um, this is the idea of greenhouse land uh, for food crops. So this is a place that, um, I believe this was in Spain. Uh, you probably read about it in your book, but I think it was an area that uh, is now covered in all these greenhouses. A big thing to look forward in the future is indoor agriculture, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, near cities, you'll see high-rise buildings that are indoor agriculture. It's already happening. That would be a good thing for us also in 2018, 2019 uh, to talk about in class. But uh, here we go. All right, so... Um, Traditional subsistence agriculture, that was, um, you know, just before we had, um, you know, people were working the thing, the farm. This was before it was industrialized. That was the idea. And in it, they started raising a bunch of stuff here, but uh, that's when um, 
we can start talking about some of the things that came a little bit later as well. Polyculture is something that we could talk about in that it is more of a sustainable method in that you don't, uh, it's, well, it's, again, it's the, one of the uh, advantages of biodiversity. And that is a polyculture. You have a few different plants going at the same time. So if one of them gets taken out for whatever reason and the other one isn't affected by that, you're still good. And it also affects the soil in a different way. So polyculture is beneficial. If you just have monoculture, you know, one plant species and it gets wiped out, you're done. The slash and burn uh, agriculture uh, that you see there, uh, that's what they do in the rainforest a lot of times. They, they just chop it down, they burn it to the ground, and they move it out and they very quickly farm it and it's good for a little while a short while and then a few years later they have to move on to another place because they've used up all the nutrients in the soil which are very much at the surface level in the uh, in the rainforest okay so we should be doing this we should be talking about soil and how soil is put together and what soil is advantageous and uh, here we go. One of the things that you want to talk about is the idea of what it's made of. And a lot of that, too, is going to come down from the idea of weathering and things being break, broken down over time. Another thing for soil found formation that's very important is lichens. We've talked about that. A mixture of a, funga, a fungus and an algae that is the, the start of primary succession, which means you need soil to form. Uh, so that's the idea of that. You are responsible for knowing the horizons here, and I'll give you a picture of that in a little bit, but these are the layers. The O horizon is the leaf litter. We have a lot of that here in New Jersey. That's the uh, temperate deciduous forest, and we're getting a lot of that at the time of my making of this video. It's just fall time right now. All the leaves are falling down. And then you've got the topsoil, the subsoil, and then the parent material. And a big concern with the soil is the erosion. So if the soil gets worn away, the nutrients get washed away, and the soil doesn't do what you need it to do. Uh, so that's the idea there. All right. Now here is a picture that gives you an idea of the horizons, as they call them, the layers, uh, if you will. So the parent material, there's the rock that the soil built on during primary succession. And then you've got the subsoil, which is a combination of both. And then the topsoil and the O horizon, which is the leaf litter. So there you get a really good idea of what's going on. Okay, and here they're also showing you this is mature soil, if it's younger soil, and if it's just started out. They give you an idea of the successions going on there. That's a good one there. Another thing that your book doesn't do when we're talking about soil here is uh, talk about the soil pyramids. Uh, but we'll be doing that in class, you can be sure about that. So look out for those soil pyramids. Uh, that's a thing that we don't talk about here, but we will talk about in class. All right, so the green culture, the green revolution, rather, this is where we learned, and this is human ingenuity again. Amazing, really, that we figured this out. But the idea of what the plants need to grow and how we can keep the pests off them and how we can irrigate. And this is the green revolution, and it ties right in with the idea of industrialized farming. Uh, and multi-cropping, that you can plant a lot of different things as well. And the second green revolution is these GMOs. And with these revolutions here, we have tripled in production. GMOs have advantages. Maybe we build ones that can handle situations differently than the regular crop or give a greater yield. Maybe they can handle less water. Um, you know, these are the... The things maybe they're uh, not as susceptible to pests. There's lots of things you can do there, and we're really only scratching the surface. So the uh, production uh, production has tripled. Population is going up, but the amount of food that we can get is going up too. And this is what uh, what you're seeing here: the per capita amount of, that's been uh, happening and the total amount. You can see the total amount is going up, steadily going up. But per capita is staying pretty even there. So we're keeping up with the population growth. So that's pretty good. Uh, how long can we do that? And these are interesting questions. All right, so then again, there again, you see the green production going up on a steady climb. And how per capita is kind of leveled off there after the 70s. So mostly during my lifetime. All right, so here we go. It's a big business right now, as we're saying, and it has changed over dramatically the amount of people that have to work to get us our food and uh, the amount of people we're able to feed. So, yeah, agribusiness here. 17% of the uh, world's grains and not much of the labor. So it's very efficient, and uh, there we go. And in the United States, we spend, they say, 2% of our income on food. I, I think mine might be a little bit higher than that. 
but um, but uh, certainly nothing that I'm complaining about. I have food security, and I'm never wondering where it's coming from. In developing countries, the amount of their money that they spend on food can be a lot different, and at the present moment, uh, the estimates are that it can be even up to 40% of your um, income is spent on food. And of course, that leaves you left to, less to spend on other things, and you know, we're pretty lucky. All right, another thing is the um, the gene revolution, and that's been going on for a long time. We have been crossbreeding through artificial selection, and that's where you let the plants, uh, the seeds from the plants, plant them the next year if they have characteristics that you like. And after a while, through artificial selection, you get a species that has what you like uh, in it. So that's been done with agriculture, and a lot of things, uh, other things as well. Uh, dogs come to mind. You know, we get the breed we want. We keep letting those, the ones that have the characteristics characteristics we want reproduce until uh, there you go and that can take generations and generations but that's a slow process but now we've got to the point again with human ingenuity where we can modify the genes and that's a pretty new thing here in 2018 2019 it's been around for a little while but it's relatively new especially you know it wasn't around when I was uh, the age of my students let's put it that way so this is a relatively new thing and uh, We'll see where it goes. Like they say, or Edward O. Wilson pointed out, or I read in his book, uh, human knowledge doubles every 15 to 20 years. So uh, it's amazing the things that we're learning and how much more we're picking up. So these are the things, like I was mentioning before, that uh, you can develop crops that are resistant to, and that's uh, that can be helpful. That can help out. So I'm going to move on because I've mentioned these before, but you can certainly pause. And uh, we're also coming up with new ways of changing the um, the gene transfers. So here's a little bit of an idea, and I'm not going to really go through this whole thing with you, but again, pause, take a look at it, and uh, see what you're doing. Uh, messing with the DNA, DNA here, and uh, putting in a gene from something else. I guess now I am going through it, right? <laughs> it is pretty amazing. So you can take uh, something from another uh, plant, or, you know, with characteristics that you like, put it into the thing that you're going to grow, and you get something that's a little bit different, and there you go. You end up with a plant that has different traits. So we can narrow it down, and <laughs> our understanding of all this is growing uh, pretty quickly as well. Okay, so what else have we industrialized? Well, meat production uh, grows as well. It seems that as people get into the developed stage and have a little bit more money, they want more meat, so the amount of meat is going up steadily that we eat. And uh, we're expecting it to go higher as more people are moving out of uh, poverty and become more part of the developed world. Well, if all of this is a developing world anyway, because it's all in progress. Amazing where we are and where we've come from. Now, this doesn't seem like a great life for a cow. I love driving across the country, and it's always nice when you see a few cows on the hill. And uh, that's not the way it is for this industrialized meat production. So we have made um, a factory style of this as well. And it has consequences environmentally. And uh, some people don't like the idea of eating uh, animals anyway. And that's an interesting moral question as well, and uh, where your values are. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not going away anytime soon. So we will talk about that a little bit as the course goes on as well. And uh, we're talking about fish as well. And the idea with fish is that uh, it's the last wild caught uh, food that we have, really, right? I've mentioned that before, maybe. Um, but yeah, you think about it, we're still we're still out there catching it. And in the last chapter, we talked about the industrialized methods of that. But this aquaculture is a new, big, growing area uh, for how we're going to produce uh, food, seafood. And polyaquaculture is kind of like the, trying to replicate the closed loop that nature always has, that there's not any waste going through the cycle. So if you're eating your fish, maybe you're growing the plants as well that they eat. Maybe you are capturing the uh, waste products and turning them into nutrients that grow the plants that can feed the fish, and maybe you get uh, a closed loop going on there. That's the idea of polyaquaculture. All right, so here gives you an idea, again, we're going up to 2010, so we can talk about this a little bit more, how aquaculture has started to make a big jump up and uh, raising our own fish. So there's the amount of uh, wild, uh, world fish catch per person. And, um, well, that was about a few years old, that data. So here's another website for you. When I go back, you can uh, mark it down if you want to. Try to put it on the class material as well. Um, but this is the fisheries here. So this is the um, 
national. So this is the United States government putting this out for you and telling you where we are at right now. So there's great links to go through here. This is all about fisheries. Anything you want to know about. There's such a wealth of information. Have I mentioned it before that taking five minutes here or five minutes there is just time well spent. Uh, here's a place where you could go fishing and seafood. And right here it's all about sustainable seafood, aquaculture, commercial fishing, and uh, aquaculture since we were talking about that. This will tell you where we're at with aquaculture right now. And uh, yeah, so uh, aquaculture currently in 2018, 2019, it seems, uh, supplies more than 50% of all seafood for human uh, consumption. So the numbers are going up. And uh, always good to check in and see where it is at uh, currently as the years go by. Uh, but yeah, there's a November 2018, that's when I'm making this video, Marine Fisheries Advisory uh, Committee meeting. So this keeps you right in touch with what's going on with the fisheries. And anything you want to know, you can find out pretty quickly uh, in this day and age. All right, so if you want to look for that uh, site, I would suggest it. Spend a few minutes there. That's not a bad thing to do. Just hit pause, and, and you're there. Okay, so let's see here. Now um, we're going to be talking about the um, environmental impacts of this stuff, and there's a nice graphic for you here too. But you can imagine that all of these things uh, listed on this page are going to be things that are going to be effects of agriculture. Good to feed us, but we've got to look at the consequences too, and always an eye to sustainability. All right, so of course it makes sense that we have biodiversity loss uh, from this going on. And, um, you know, from the agriculture, the stuff that runs into the water, how the livestock's affected by that, pesticides uh, work on the things that you're trying to get rid of, but other things as well. <coughs> and um, also you're getting to monoculture, so that's going to be a thing. So you have to take out grasslands and forests and wetlands. Obviously leads to erosion, and uh, that's another thing that we're doing from the food production, and we're losing the nutrients over time. We're using so much water for uh, this, that that's going to be a big deal. Here again, they're talking about algal blooms, and we know that's cultural eutrophication that we've talked about a few times. Uh, that's something to be thinking about. We're going to start naming names on the air pollution. So it's a good idea to start getting used to what air pollution is. Uh, we haven't come to the air pollution chapter yet, but it's a good idea to figure this all out. Here's another thing under human health that is uh, problematic, the nitrates. That's the blue baby syndrome. Uh, okay. And the contamination of the... All right, so there you go. Good to a pause. These are all great things to know and great connections to be made. And this is the... You know, this is the degrad this is the problem, the downside uh, to food production that we should also be aware of and uh, use our human ingenuity to try to keep that from happening. All right, so large parts of the earth have uh, problems with erosion. That's a naturally occurring thing. Rain causes erosion. Water causes erosion. Wind causes erosion. Um, but we also contribute to that by, uh, you know, maybe taking trees out. Trees with their roots are going to hold the ground so there's left less erosion. And uh, there you go. With the uh, soil erosion, you're losing the nutrients that are in there. The nutrients get into the water where it's too much of a good thing and cultural eutrophication. And there's so many uh, connections that we can make now to the idea of erosion and to other problems. Here's an eroded out area and uh, that's a very quick erosion and I've seen some pretty crazy videos of the uh, soil being eroded and all the stuff washing into the water. And maybe we'll see some of those in class or you should look for them as well. Look for erosion and take five minutes. And, uh, you know, another good thing, and this is a good time to point it out, I'll probably point this out a lot of times, but this says it's in Bolivia, that's in South America. But with Google Earth and the things that are available to us now, sometimes when you hear these places, uh, take a look at where they are in the world. That's a good thing. All right, so these are places that have some concern for uh, erosion. You can see the United States is not immune from that. Here is serious concern, and uh, here's places that are stable or non-vegetative. So um, lots of places have concerns for soil erosion. Oh, it looks like Florida doesn't. <laughs> so that's a good thing. All right, desertification. This is when there is so much erosion and so much loss of nutrients that you've gone from soil that is something that you could grow things in to sand-like uh, situations where you can't really uh, do that. So productive potential is down, and it's severe if it becomes 50% less productive than it was at the beginning. So we, of course, if the temperatures are rising, that's going to help this to happen as well. And, uh, and there you go. 
and there is, you can see cropland right there and the desert right behind it, and that's a severe case. And uh, here are places that have desertification. You can see out west for us, luckily for us, we're in a place that's not like that. Uh, but of course, other places that you could uh, predict as well in the Middle East and in Africa, uh, which makes sense. South America, you can see, and also Australia. Okay, so uh, irrigation. <laughs> well, there, you got to have the water, and we need the fresh water, and seven and a half billion people need water and counting. So these are the things that we have to talk about. Some of the things is where you use too much irrigation, so that's water logging, the soil is too wa uh, uh, water, too much water in it, and salinization is where you mix in too much salt after a while, and then uh, your crops can't grow the way they could before. All right, so this is salinization, and uh, you know, after a while, there's a little bit of salt, there's a little bit of salt, but the salt doesn't go away, and then uh, there you go. And it's very expensive to clean up soil like that. Okay, so what else can we do with the Green Revolution? The GMOs, I mentioned now, I think the idea of uh, vertical farming inside of buildings, you have to use less water, it's going to be less evaporation, less pesticides, of course. Uh, so GMOs, is that the answer? Uh, getting better at irrigation, uh, irrigating more cropland, probably all of these things uh, are going to happen, that's for sure. But right now, irrigation is 70% of the world's water use, and that is a big thing to be thinking about, especially if you're concerned with sustainability and feeding all these people. All right, also lots of energy has to go into this, so that right now that's a big fossil fuel use, and we always talk, we should talk about net energy. Not a matter of just how much you get out, but how much you had to put in to get that energy in the first place, because these come at energy costs as well as environmental costs. And that's the deal with food. The amount of energy and measurable energy that we get out of food, it's uh, we put in 10 times as much of the fossil fuels to get it. So there's a payoff and a trade-off, and the payoff is well, we get to feed a lot more people, and our, you know, we get to raise a lot more food, but we're using a lot of fossil fuel, and we have to think about sustainability, and uh, we'll see how that goes in the future. Okay, so um, there we go. Industrial agriculture uses about 17% of all the energy in the United States. Now, that is maybe old information by the time we got to 2018, 2019. That's worth looking up. I won't find all the web pages for you, but you should certainly follow those trains of thought down. Uh, but I think this is a pretty good idea that uh, raising food does use a good percentage of our energy. All right, so pros and cons on genetic uh, engineered foods. And then you really open up the idea of genetically modified animals as well. And then you have to open up the talk to humans. And again, this comes to your beliefs and your, your worldview and your moral stance. And all these things come into play in environmental and economic issues. Um, so yeah, I'm not one to tell you what to think. Uh, but uh, these are controversial issues. No GMOs in my Cheerios. I don't know that I was bothered by the GMOs, but um, it becomes a uh, advertising thing as well. People are concerned about these things, and we don't know too much about it yet. Uh, although that Nobel Prize winner on the page of the Golden Corn uh, would give you a, a short talk about why he thought it was a good idea, you might want to listen to that. I found it interesting. Okay, since um, okay, so since 1900, we have lost 75% of the biodiversity for our agricultural crops. Like I said, there's a lot of crops we can eat. We're down to 14, and uh, in India, they used to have 30,000 varieties of rice, and now there's 10 that they use. So that's uh, that's kind of interesting. All right, chimeroplasty is where you don't combine with another species, so you just alter the uh, the gene there. Um, and again, we're learning more and more about this. So these are, like <laughs> at this time, projected advantages and projectable dis uh, projected disadvantages. So we don't really know. The long-term studies aren't, uh, aren't out with genetically modified uh, foods. But definitely something worth looking into to see what it is. We'll, we'll definitely we'll talk about that in class. All right. So good to pause here and see some of the projected advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so when you um, replace forest and grassland, obviously, so yeah, th that's the whole point of these things. I think we've said all of these things uh, already, except the idea of the seed banks. As we're losing our biodiversity and we're going over the rainforest, one of the things that we're doing is collecting uh, seeds in a seed bank. And we uh, have here the address for you if you want to take a tour. It's at uh, croptrustus.org. I'll take you on a preview of the tour. And here is the uh, page. This is always a good one. And uh, yeah, they tell you right there, 
Norwegian, is that where it is? Yeah, the Svalbard Global uh, Seed uh, Vault. All right, so let's uh, let's take a look around here. And uh, yeah, it looks a little bit this cold there. This is the there. entrance to one of the most remarkable facilities on Earth. There's the, the entrance. Svalbard Global. Now let's go inside. So here we are inside. As we open the heavy entrance door, we step into the portal building. Let's do it. As we open the door and begin to walk down the 130 meter long tunnel, the air gets noticeably cooler. Now look at this. Um, here there are uh, little things that you can, uh, you know, click on. You'll find out about it. It's minus five degrees. How cold is it? That tells you. It also becomes and so clear. quickly you can find out all kinds of information. Downward slope makes it easier to move the boxes in. Okay. And, uh, of course, they're giving you a video narrative, so I'm not going to let you go through it all right now. Just give you the idea. Here we are in the main chamber. We are now deep inside the mountain. While the rock is naturally dark in color, the walls are coated with a mix of... Just my point being that it's amazing. We're mm -hmm. now at the final stop on our journey, <laughs> the vault room, where the seeds are stored. Yeah, so the resource is available cool. to you. Oh, there's Martha Stewart. <laughs> That's a new one. I hadn't seen Martha there before. They've added that since the last time I took the tour. All right, Martha. All right, so anyway, uh, this is... Uh, oops. So this is the uh, the tour that I was going to take now. Let me see if I can turn Martha off. All right, Martha, we'll get back to you another time. And thank you very much. All right, so here we are back in with the slideshow. <laughs> All right. So anyway, a quick tour, and uh, yeah, you should feel free to take a tour as well. you got some time. All right, so there are advantages, of course, to the meat production that's industrialized. You can feed a lot more people. You can cut down on the cost of it. And uh, then there are the disadvantages as well, and here they are for you as well. So yeah, the feedlots cut down on overgrazing, which cuts down on soil erosion. That seems like a pretty good thing. And then there's the disadvantages here too. So... Uh, large inputs of all these kind of things. You got to feed the cattle, so you got to do that. Fossil fuels used every step of the way. Uh, lots of animal wastes, antibiotics that are getting into the food chain. All right, and uh, methane. That's uh, cattle belching. <laughs> cattle belching and cattle farting. Actually, let's let's just say say it for what it is. Amounts for what uh, percentage of the global annual emissions of methane? What's your guess? Uh, with the making of this video, it's 16 percent. So that's a lot. And humans figuring these things out. They're now trying to make food that will cause them less gas. So that seems like a good thing. Okay, so we know the idea of aquaculture already. Hopefully you're clicking on some of these links. Here are the advantages and disadvantages of aquaculture in one stop. Please feel free to pause. I'm going to feel free to move on right now. Uh, after I make a couple comments, but uh, yeah, um, look at the disadvantages, the mangrove forests and estuaries, but remember the mangrove forests? What I say was implicated in that. That is the uh, shrimp aquaculture is uh, with that. Okay, so there we go. And a pest, and we're trying to cut down on these pests. Uh, my mother used to call us pests growing up. I guess we were at times a little annoying. Uh, but pests are things that uh, are annoying. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. And these are pests that we're talking about that are cutting into our food supply. So if it's your garden at home, or whether it's the food that you're going to put on the shelves, you would like to get ways around this. Um, so they're natural out there, and the pests are part of the ecosystem. So what happens when we interfere? Ooh, that's a good picture your textbook has of a spider that go after the the uh, insects, that's pretty good. Um, so that's a natural way of doing it, and we, through human ingenuity, have figured out how to kill them. We can kill weeds and herbicides, we can kill insects that are pests with insecticides, funguses with fungicides, and rodents with rodenticides. All right, so there we go. And uh, of course, now you understand that if you are, let's say, trying to take out an insect or, a, or an herb, an herbivore, uh, another plant, uh, there are going to be an arms race because there will be co-evolution. Members of the species that can handle your thing that's trying to kill them will be able to successfully reproduce. And then you're going to have to change your herbicide or your insecticide. And uh, there we go. Humans have figured this out not too long ago, and as happened with the first wave of a lot of these things, is we had no idea what the environmental consequences were going to be, and then we found out the unintended consequences. We're in a time period in human existence where we now know there can be some pretty devastating consequences. Uh, 
uh, unintended consequences. So DDT was a broad spectrum agent. It killed a lot of different things. And another big thing about uh, DDT that was problematic is it stayed in the environment for so long. And it was used to kill mosquitoes, so that was a good thing. And uh, it also, they found out, killed a lot of other things. Didn't out and out kill the birds, but it, what it did is compromise their eggs so that uh, the, they couldn't really give birth to another generation. And a friend had pointed this out to Rachel Carson, who was a biologist, and she looked into it and she determined or figured out that it was DDT that caused it. And she wrote a book about it called Silent Spring, which is one of the books that was really spurred on this uh, age of understanding the unintended consequences. And she caught a lot of trouble for that. Um, the company that was making the DDT didn't want to stop making the profits on the DDT. Uh, so they went after her and they attacked her. And um, she was at the time dying of cancer, but didn't tell anybody about it because she didn't want that to be part of the discussion. She wanted it to be more about the DDT and uh, the Silent Spring. So very interesting person, Rachel Carson. And that's uh, one of the first books there that kicked off the... Uh, environmental movement, uh, which is again, uh, we can't, uh, we don't live in a time where we don't know about the unintended consequences. That wasn't too long ago, but this kicked off the era of where we're going to look into these things. And there you go, there's a picture of Rachel, Rachel Carson. All right, so um, yeah, there's an idea of spraying DDT, and uh, I don't know if these are all DDT trucks, but um, when I was a kid, they used to. They used to spray things to kill the mosquitoes, and they still do. Um, there's the Mosquito Commission, and um, they do things right in the Thompson Park woods. We've seen them out there sometimes. Okay, so uh, these are good. These uh, things, they're great. You know, uh, mosquitoes cause malaria. They cause, uh, the rats cause bubonic plague. I mean, these things, are, this is great to kill off these pests, right? Uh, they do a, a really good job of doing that. And they also are really great for farmers as well. So you can make a lot more profit. You spend a dollar on the pesticides, that gives you $4 profit you weren't going to have before. And uh, there you go. And we're understanding more and more what we're doing. So we got ourselves some amazing pesticides that we developed, and then we realized some of the negative effects. So we're trying to do better on that in the future, and uh, that's where we're at right now. So they can be, can be okay. Now, there is a problem with this, and part of that is the idea of the, um, you know, the co-evolution that goes on. So the farmers, once they start buying them, you got to keep buying them. And uh, there's all kinds of questions going on with that. Okay, so if you kill the predators, then uh, you are maybe turning a minor pest into a major pest if you're also killing their predators. And uh, yeah, kind of like the bycatch, you end up killing a lot of other things, um, you know, than uh, what you intended to. Okay, so uh, they can be wiping out the honeybee, which is obviously a big problem because it's a major pollinator for us. And uh, so these are some of the things that we're aware of and have really started to look at in, uh, currently in 2018, 2019. Actually, all the stuff with the honeybees was happening a little bit sooner. We're getting a little bit better at our understanding of that, and we're somewhat concerned about that. Okay, so agricultural work workers, kids in households, of course, these things can be harmful. All right, and there are people who say that the pesticides use has not uh, uh, reduced the amount of crop loss, um, but we're definitely making more uh, food, that's for sure. Okay, so here are some of the advantages and the disadvantages. We've already kind of talked about them, but you can uh, take another look at that. And uh, Roundup is, an, is another one that has uh, some things going on with it. Um, Roundup is very effective. Uh, it works very well. It, cleans, it uh, clears out the weeds very well. But then again, it has the unintended consequences of maybe harming some other things as well. And uh, the other thing with Roundup is, uh, like we said before, it can be, um, uh, it, it can be helping you to get plants that you are going to need something else for in the future. So you're helping the evolution of the plants as well. So here are some of the things you can do to reduce your exposure. Organic foods are very popular right now. I'm suggesting vertical uh, agriculture. That might be a good place to invest in 2018, 2019. Uh, I think that's a big growth industry that's coming. And uh, yeah, cutting down on the meat that you eat and uh, the pesticides. Like a lot of these things are persistent and a lot of that persistent stuff is stuff that is fat soluble. So it stays in the tissue and it, uh, you don't get rid of it. So once you have it, it's, uh, it's there. So that's why they recommend trim, trimming, trimming the uh, fat from the meat.
All right, so here's another uh, pesticide from uh, mosquitoes that was good, put malaria in check, but it was in the food chain. So this is a place where they, um, I forget where it happened, but they had thatched roofs, and uh, this was good. It killed the flies and the cockroaches, but it also killed the lizards that, uh, that ate them and the uh, cats that ate the rats, and the rats then uh, took over. <laughs> so the rats weren't affected by any of this stuff, but uh, their pred their prey species, the, or the predator species that would feed on the rats were, and uh, that caused the rats to be everywhere, and that was a problem. They ended up actually helicoptering in cats, which I thought was a good one, and uh, also caterpillars, because the lizards were dead and out of the food chain. Uh, caterpillars were uh, eating their thatched roofs, and the roofs were falling in. Uh, anyway, like I said, they helicoptered in the cats, and they realized what had happened. Uh, but yeah, these unintended consequences, they make you wonder a little bit about that precautionary principle and how far should you go with things before you know what's going to happen. So hard to tell with all the different factors that are out there in the real world. All right, there are so many acronyms that you need to know, and these agencies are good ones for you to know as well. And uh, yeah, so now we're more aware of these things, and we're trying to protect people from them. And these are some of the agencies that you should be aware of. Um, exports, um, some things that we ban here in the United States, we then um, uh, export it to other countries. They use that stuff, and then they maybe grow food that comes back to us. So that's the boomerang effect, where some of the stuff that we ban here comes back to us anyway. And, uh, yeah, it's just hard to tell. Uh, we're, we're finding out more about this stuff all the time, but we're really early on in the era of where we invented all these things that were so damaging to the environment and then also figuring out what we can do to work our way around it, clean them up, and what are the effects. And, uh, yeah, so it's a little hard to figure out. All right, so this is the alternatives to pesticides, and uh, this is part of the uh, IPM, which is the Integrated... Uh, pest management where you try to do a bunch of different things so um, there are things that you can do besides uh, fool it and yeah, look over there uh, bring in the pests enemies to get rid of them genetic resistance there you go all uh, right so uh, maybe spray the smell that chases them away that's possible scald them with hot water there you go all right, so this is the uh, genetic engineering to reduce pest damage. So that seems like a viable option. We're getting into that. And there is the natural capital where they um, get rid of them for you. Integrated pest management is, as I mentioned before, this is bringing everything into it. Maybe you still use pesticides, but use other methods as well. You use an integrated approach. Now, the disadvantages are you have to really know what you're doing. Uh, and there are, like I said, so many variables. Now, we're getting there. Uh, what do we say? Every uh, 15 to 20 years, human knowledge doubles. So we're figuring out how all these things work uh, all the time. And uh, we'll see, but there's expert knowledge, and you have to get that information out to people before it can be effective. Okay, so let's see what we can do. We can cut down on subsidies for uh, food production. And uh, this is, I think a lot of this, the market does decide, you know, of what we're doing here. Like, uh, we have a market now for whole foods in 2018 and 2019, where people pay extra for healthier foods. And Wegmans, somewhere in the middle of your regular grocery store here in New Jersey, and uh, the Whole Foods, where uh, they are also um, have an eye to sustainability and also to what's healthy. Um, so you can also do it through, um, you know, world organizations as well. You can do it through laws. So here are some of the things that we can do. These are good things to look up here. And also, um, we can do things that will cut down on the soil erosion. So uh, like it is with fishing practices, like it is with a lot of things, here we want you to know, uh, they want you to know the different types of growing and how we can do that. So also uh, identify areas where there are hot spots. But um, here is uh, the terrace farming. So you can turn that in mountains into terraced farming. That's one way that we do it. And here is the idea of strip cropping. So you have different crops growing along each other. We've already talked about the advantages of uh, polycropping. So that's the contour and the strip cropping. You should know a little bit about that. Here's the alley cropping, which gives you a natural windbreak. And uh, that's the idea there. And here are windbreaks also, where it's even more of a deal here for protecting the crops from the wind. So you can see the alley cropping is growing in between the uh, trees there. And here's where you put all kinds of stuff around as a barrier. 
And here is monoculture uh, planted in strips, a mixture of monoculture crops, all right? So you can see it's just the green crop, crop that's coming out is green and brown. Uh, maybe corn and wheat, I don't know. Um, okay, so the Dust Bowl is a place where human activities were exasperating what would happen natural, uh, naturally, and that was really in a really rough time for the United States, so these things can uh, happen anywhere, and when we look to troubles like this that are happening in the developed world, we have to remember that we've gone through these kind of things before. There was a lot of poverty here in the United States not too long ago, and this exasperated it. Um, but uh, we had uh, unsustainably been farming the stuff out in the Midwest, and that area there uh, was more susceptible to erosion. So they had a period of particularly high winds and low moisture, and uh, there was devastating results. And I've seen some videos on this, and it's like, you know, like it's like one morning you wake up and it's like there was a big snowfall or something. There's all this dust. It's just you can't contain it. The crops aren't there to hold it, and it's piled up you know, four feet in front of your door. So, uh, yeah, pretty dramatic things, and those people are hardy individuals to live through all that. Okay, so uh, we know about that a little bit more. We found out the causes, and we try to pre prevent it. And, yeah, here's a dramatic picture from the, uh, from the Dust Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, really tough time in American history. Okay, and uh, these are the areas that were affected. Uh, so you can see those are areas out there that are, um, that's, a, that's a large area there. And this, like I was talking about before, this led to uh, some people stayed. Those were very hardy people and lots and lots of people left. And they tried to make it across to California. And when they got to California, you know, the people there said, well, we don't really want you at the door. There's some very good Woody Guthrie songs, the Dust Bowl ba ballads from those era, that era that paints a picture. And a good Ken Burns documentary. That's where I got my information on the Dust Bowl. Uh, but there you go. So uh, we can do things to restore the fertility of the soil, organic uh, fertilizer, stuff that's naturally. That's part of the, what would be the closed loop anyway. And animal manure is that, you know, waste products, uh, compost, so anything that uh, old food material that will break down. This is what happens naturally in uh, nature, and we can use that to our advantage as well. And then there's all the stuff that we've learned from commercial uh, inorganic fertilizers, and that's where we add nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, nitrates and phosphates in particular to the soil, and um, that's the inorganic fertilizer. We learned that as well. So um, again, I talked about soil salinization before, and I've talked about the idea of desertification as well. And the soil salinization, much easier to prevent than it is to clean it up, and uh, that's true with so many things, right? Okay. And here's the things we have to cut down on to cut down on desertification. All right, so here you go. That's the cleanup. It's so expensive. And yes, yeah, switch to crops that can handle it. Yeah, there's a, there's a solution. And we've talked about being more sustainable with our aquaculture, polyculture, as I mentioned before. If you choose herbivorous fish, the lower you are on the food chain, the more energy you have per unit uh, area. So that's going to be uh, more energy from that. Here are things that we can do for more sustainable agriculture. So you should probably pause the video, no offense taken, and uh, see what you can see there. Okay, and uh, the, here are the things that we can do more efficiently with the uh, meat as well. So eating less meat is probably a big one. Less red meat would be a big deal. The lower on the trophic scale we feed, the less environmental impact we'll have, and in many ways it's uh, healthier. I've already mentioned the uh, whole food markets where uh, the, how you treat the animals is part of it as well. Okay, and this is the idea of the um, efficiency here. So this is how much you have to put in. So fish or carp, you put in a lot less uh, energy to get out one. In, uh, in the beef and the cattle, you got to put in a lot more energy. Seven units of energy for every one unit that you get back. So that's uh, an idea of how much uh, more sustainable it is when you're lower on the food chain. Or, and also beef and, and red meat in particular is really intensive on the agriculture, on the environment, I'm sorry. Okay, so these are things that we can do, be more organic, okay, teach people how to do it, training programs, these all make good sense. And uh, did I mention vertical agriculture? Indoor vertical agriculture, I think that'll be a big deal. 
Okay, so this is what organic farming does. Another good time to take a pause. And I'm moving on. Okay, so this is the idea of polycultures and perennial crops. Perennials, you don't have to plant every year, so you don't have to disturb the soil every year, so they're better. And uh, annuals, you do. That's the, the difference there. Annuals, you have to go through every year. Okay, so we don't have to replant. Cuts down on soil erosion. Deeper roots. Here shows you an annual and a perennial. Just I don't even know what these crops are, but just the idea that the roots are a lot deeper for the perennial, which is on the right. And uh, by locally grown, that makes sense. Less fossil fuels to get it to you and um, support your local community. So that's good. I always like to go to farmer's markets. we got a lot of them around here. And what you can do is on the left here about sustainable organic uh, agriculture. And that, like I said, is a big, big thing right now. That's what it always was in the past. And now it's... Uh, you know, it was local and organic, and uh, now after these revolutions, we're seeing the benefits of going back to it in some ways. All right, and that's the end of this video. I know it was a long one. hope it was helpful for you. Thank you for your time. Glad you uh, watched it, and look forward to seeing you back in class.